Chapter 6 Not in West Virginia is as dark as black can be. No car light sweeping across my walls or ceiling like when I stay overnight at, with David Howard down in Friendly. No street lamps shining in the windows. No lights from next door houses. Where I live, there ain't no street lamps at all. No house close enough to see from our windows. My eyes are open anyway. I stare up into the darkness of the living room and the darkness stares back. I'm remembering how once, several years ago, when Ma bought milk chocolate rabbits one Easter for me and Daryl Lynn, I'd finished eating mine, but Daryl Lynn took only a nibble of hers every day or so, keeping it up on her dresser in its pink and yellow tin foil, driving me nuts. And one day I just crept in there and ate off one of that rabbit's ears. Daryl Lynn, of course, threw a fit, and when Ma asked me if I'd done it, I said no. I could feel my cheeks and neck burning red. You sure, Marty? she asked. I'd only nodded and left the room. It was one of the worst days of my life. About an hour later, she came out on the porch while I was pushing myself slow in the swing and sat down beside me. You know, Marty, she said, Daryl Lynn don't know who ate the ear off her candy rabbit, and I don't know who did it, but Jesus knows. And right this very minute, Jesus is looking down with the saddest eyes on the one person who ate that chocolate. Bible says that the worst thing that can ever possibly happen to us is to be separated forever from God's love. I hope you'll keep that in mind. I just swallowed and didn't say anything. But before I went to bed, when Ma asked me again about the rabbit, I gulped and said yes, and she made me get down on my knees and ask God's forgiveness, which wasn't so bad. I honestly felt better afterwards, but then she said that Jesus wanted me to go in the next room, tell Daryl Lynn what I'd done, and Daryl Lynn had a fit all over again, threw a box of Crayolas at me, and could have broke my nose, called me rotten, greedy pig, and that made Jesus sad. If that made Jesus sad, Ma never said. Now, as I study the darkness in the room around me, I'm thinking about lies again. I hadn't lied to Judd Travers when I said I hadn't seen his dog in the yard today. That was the honest-to-God truth, because Shiloh hadn't been anywhere near our yard. But I also know that you can lie not only by what you say, but what you don't say. Nothing I'd told Judd was an outright lie, but what I'd kept inside myself made him think that I hadn't seen his dog at all. Jesus, I whispered finally, what you want, what you want me to do? Be 100% honest and carry that dog back to Judd so that one of your creatures can be kicked and starved all over again or keep him here and fatten him up to glorify your creation? The question seemed to answer itself. And I'm pretty proud of that prayer. Repeat it to myself so I remembered it in case I need to use it again. If Jesus is anything like the story cards from Sunday school made him out to be, he ain't the kind to want a thin little beagle to be hurt. Problem's more mixed up than that, though. I'm lying to my folks as well. I'm not eating the leftover meatloaf I've put away. Every bit of food saved is money saved that could go to buy Daryl a new pair of sneakers so Ma won't have to cut open the tops of the old ones and give her toes more room. Every little bit of food wasted is money wasted. If we ever have the least bit of money to spare, that doesn't have to go for the care of Grandma Preston. First thing we all want is a telephone so we won't have to ride down to Doc Murphy's to use his. By the way, I figure if it's food from my own plate, I would have eaten myself, but don't. What's the harm in that? Next morning, I get up to see Shiloh, put the rope on his collar, and lead him to the other side of the hill again, out of the sight of all but God. Then I let him go, and we race and tumble and laugh and roll, stopping now and then just to lie in the clover, me on my back, Shiloh on my stomach, both of us panting and nuzzling each other. Don't know if Shiloh's getting more human or I'm getting to be more dog. If Jesus ever comes back to earth, I'm thinking he'll come as a dog because there isn't anything as humble 
or patient or loving or loyal as the dog I have in my arms right now. We eat our Sunday meal, but by late afternoon, storm clouds roll in and the rain beats down on the tin roof of our house, streaming down the window glass, making a small pond in the side yard. Can't help staring out the windows at the far hill. Will Shiloh, can he even leap that fence to try to go somewhere or some more dry? Is he smart enough to go under the lean-to I made for him? If I built it right, away from the wind? What if he gets to howling? In 20 minutes, the rain stops, though. The sun comes out and the birds start to sing again. All those worms oozing up through the wet mud. Shiloh stayed where he was, trusting me that where I put him was the best, being quiet like he knows his life depends on it. Marty, Dad says, going outside with a rag to wipe off his jeep. I saw Mrs. Howard yesterday, and she said David was back from Tennessee, wanting to know when you boys could get together. She and David would like to come up here some day next week. I like David Howard fine, but I sure don't want him up here. David likes the hill, always wants to play up there. He's not afraid of snakes the way Daryl Lynn is. David, in fact, he likes to go to the very top of that hill and then go run and lick and split down it, racing to see who's first to the fence at the bottom. Likes to climb the trees up there, too, and play lookout. Well, I'll go down to David's tomorrow, I say. I'd rather do that. Why not do both, Ma says, coming out to throw some mash to the hands. You've hardly seen any friends all summer, Marty. Why don't you go down to Friendly one afternoon and ask David to come up here another? There's nothing much to do up here, I say, not knowing how else to answer. It was the wrong answer. Both Ma and Pa were looking at me now. You said just the other day you had plenty to do, Dad tells me, wringing out his rag at the pump. Lots for me to do, but not much for David Howard, I said. A lie. That's flat-out lie. Funny how one lie leads to another, and before you know it, your whole life can be a lie. I sit on the porch swing later, not even bothering to push it, listening to the table being set. What you figure's wrong with that boy, Lou? Dad's voice. Just being eleven, I guess, Ma tells him. Eleven's a moody age. Was for me, anyways. Think that's all it is? What pleases you one day don't please you at all the next. What more do you think it is? Don't think he's got that dog on his mind, do you? Eleven's got about everything on its mind, Ma answers. And then the evening news comes on and Dara, Lynn, and Becky come out to the porch, leaving the TV to Daddy. Dara Lynn's got the devil in her tonight. A little bit bored with summer, but not quite ready for school to start. Just for devilment, she plucks herself down besides me in that swing and starts doing everything I do. I sigh, she sighs. I rest my arms on my set head, she does the same. Guess Becky doing it too, both of them laughing to beat the band. When I have my fill of this nonsense, I decide to go up this hill and see how Shiloh's doing. But as I go down off the porch, Dare Lynn gets up and makes as if to follow me. I stop. I'm looking to find me a snake stick, I say, as if to myself. I'm looking to find me a snake stick, Dara Lynn says. I don't pay her no mind at all. Just start walking to the edge of the yard, picking up a stick here or a stick there, Dara Lynn tar- tagging along behind. It's got to have the longest handle and a good strong fork on the end, I say, because that was the biggest, meanest snake I ever saw in my life. Dara Lynn stops dead still. She couldn't say all she couldn't say all that night if she was tired, but she's not interested anymore in trying. What snake? she says. Snake I saw up on the hill this morning. I tell her, it must have been four, five feet long, just looking for somebody's leg to wrap it around. Dara Lynn don't go a step further. Becky don't come down off the porch. What you gonna do when you find it, Dara Lynn asks. Try to keep it from biting me first. Pick it up with my stick second, put it in a sack, and carry it clear up on past the shallow schoolhouse where I let it out in the woods there. Won't kill it unless I have to. 
Kill it, Dara Lynn said. Get your gun and blow its head off. You've been watching too much stuff on TV, Dara Lynn, I tell her. Even snakes got the right to live. I'm thinking how if I ever become a vet's helper, I got to take care of pet snakes too. The next day, to head off David Howard from riding up from Friendly on his bike, I go down to see him. I'd tended to Shiloh first, taking a fistful of scrambled eggs left over from breakfast, a bit of bacon and half a slice of whole wheat toast that I stuck in my jeans pocket. It's not enough for the dog, I know, but probably more than he'd get from Judd. It's not enough for me either. Sneaking off half my breakfast, lunch, and dinner for Shiloh like I'm doing means me going half hungry all the time. But if I eat extra, then it means Shiloh's costing us money we can't afford. I fill my pockets with wormy peaches before I set out for friendly, biting off each piece, spitting it out in my hand, and picking out the worms before I put it back in my mouth. It pleased me that Shiloh was sleeping in his lean-to when I'd gone up there this morning. The ground was dry under there. I'd brought up some old gunny sacks in the shed for him to lie on. Made it seem more like a bed to him, more like a home. The walk to Friendly takes a good long time unless I hitch a ride. I'm not allowed to get in the car with somebody I don't know, but Dad, being a mail carrier for this part of the county, I know most everybody who goes by. First person to come along this day, though, is Judd Travers. When I hear the sound of a motor and turn to see his truck slowing down, I turn forward again and keep walking, but he pulls up beside me. Want a lift? He sings out. Eh, no thanks, I say. Almost there. Where are you going? I, I couldn't think fast enough to lie. David Howard's. Hell, boy, you ain't even halfway. Hop in. I know I don't have to unless I won't, but if he's already suspicious about me, that'll only make it worse. So I get in. See my dog yet? First thing out of his mouth. I've been looking all over the roads. Tell him in answer, no beagle. Well, I don't think he'd stick to the roads, Judd says. Not a dog as shy as him. Shy as a field mouse, except when he is around rabbits. That's what the man said who sold him to me, and he sure was right about that. How much you pay for him, I ask. Got him cheap, because he's shy. Thirty-five dollars. Worth a lot more than that as a hunting dog if I could just keep the damn animal home. You gotta treat a dog good if you want him to stick around, I say, bold as brass. What you know about it? Judd jerks his head in my direction, then turns the other way and spits his tobacco out the window. You never even had a dog, did you? I figure a dog's the same as a kid. You don't treat a kid right, he'll run off first chance he gets, too. Judd laughs. Well, if that was true, I'd have run away when I was four. Far back as I can remember, Pa took the belt to me. Big old welts on my back, so raw I could hardly put my shirt on. I stuck around. Didn't have any place else to go. Turned out, didn't I? Turned out how? The boldness in my chest is growing, taking up all the air. Judd now sounds mad. You trying to be smart with me, boy? No, just asking how you turned out. Somebody who was beat since he was four, I feel sorry. That's what I feel. Judd's real quiet a moment. Big old wad of tobacco and his cheek bobs up and down. Well, don't go wasting your sorry on me, he says. Nobody ever felt sorry for me, and I never felt sorry for nobody else. Sorry is something I can do without. I don't say anything at all. We reach the road where David Howard lives. And the truck slows down. I can walk from here, I tell him. Thanks, I get out. But as I come around the truck to cross the street, Judd leans out the window. Like I said, that dog's a shy one. Don't think you'll see much of him near the road, but you keep an eye out for him in the fields. That's where he'll be, more than likely. You see him, all you do is whistle. That's what I teach him. I whistle and he comes to me. He gets fed. But he does something I don't like. I kick him clear to China. You see him, just whistle. Then hang on to him and I'll come and pick him up. You hear? I hear. I tell him. 
and I keep walking.